Madam Prime Minister, Minister Pat Conroy, distinguished ladies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Michael Fullilove, the Executive Director of the Lowy Institute. Let me begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we're gathered tonight, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Talofa Lava, welcome to the inaugural FDC Pacific Lecture. What a great pleasure it is for me personally and for the Institute to host the seventh Prime Minister of Samoa, the Honourable Fiume Naomi Mata'afa, at this beautiful venue. Welcome, Prime Minister. You'll see, Prime Minister, I'm wearing Samoan colours tonight. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I now know what it's like to accompany a rock star, because when I entered this building, um, we could barely get through the crowd. So you do us a great honour, Prime Minister, by giving this lecture, so thank you. This annual lecture is part of a collaboration between the Lowy Institute and the Foundation for Development Cooperation, a great Australian institution that does wonderful work. And let me acknowledge Anne-Marie O'Keefe, the chair, and Stephen Taylor, the executive director of the FDC. Let me also acknowledge the chief executive, uh, the secretary of DFAT, shadow ministers, thank you for joining us, ambassadors and high commissioners, Lowy Institute board members, Sir Angus Houston, Penny Wensley, and many other distinguished guests, and in particular, many other friends from the Pacific. Thank you very much for joining us. This is the first visit to Australia by a Samoan Prime Minister in nearly four years, and not just any PM, but one of the great figures from our region, someone who has led with great strength and dignity, who has served for nearly three decades in public life in Samoa, daughter of a Prime Minister and now Prime Minister herself. And in those four years, a lot has happened. Our countries have lived through a pandemic that has forced us to close ourselves off from the world and from each other. In Europe, we have seen the brutal and illegal invasion of one country by its powerful neighbor. And here in the Indo-Pacific, we've seen an intensification of geopolitical competition. Last week, Australia's Prime Minister announced the details of the AUKUS arrangement which is Australia's response to that competition, a signal of Australia's ambition to contribute to regional security, but something that will also be a big lift for our country. The government has announced new climate change targets. It's also built on the work of its predecessor and redoubled Australia's efforts in our immediate neighbourhood. We're very sorry that the Foreign Minister, Senator Wong, can't join us this evening as she tested positive for COVID this morning. But I do want to take the opportunity in her absence to compliment the Minister and the Prime Minister and Minister Conroy for the vigour and dispatch of their regional diplomacy. They have maintained really a breakneck speed of uh, visits to Southeast Asia and to the Pacific. And I think that's very important. Even as we focus on new challenges to our North, it's important that we do not turn away from the region that is closest to us. We can't lose sight of the importance of the Pacific and the relationships we have with our Pacific family. And Prime Minister, I use the term Pacific family advisedly. My brother Christian is in the audience tonight with his partner, Vai Mo'o'i'a, and they met each other in Apia in Samoa a few years ago. It's connections like these PM that I think uh, show the deep bonds between our countries that are formed in relationships, loving relationships, friendships, um, football, faith. I think these are the factors that make Australia and Samoa such natural and easy partners. So there are many things, there are many challenges for us to think about, many joint challenges from climate change and natural disasters and health and other issues, but also opportunities for us to explore. And we hope to, to, to look at some of those challenges and opportunities this evening. And now to introduce the Prime Minister, I'm delighted to call upon the Minister for Defence Industry and the Minister for International Development and the Pacific, Mr. Pat Conroy, MP. Like Senator Wong, he has been a frequent traveller to the region since the, elect, since the government was elected. He's known within the government as an energetic advocate for the Pacific. 
Before he went into parliament, he was involved in public life in other ways, working for Anthony Albanese, Minister Combe, and in the trade union movement. He's an articulate person and a formidable uh, force for the Pacific. And we're delighted that the minister has agreed to be here this evening and to introduce one of the Pacific's most respected and significant leaders. Minister, the lectern is yours. Uh, thank you, Michael, for that kind and very, very generous introduction. Uh, there's a future in politics with that sort of generosity. Um, uh, but it is a pleasure to be at the Lowe Institute event, particularly here at Old Parliament House, proudly lit up tonight in the colours of the independent state of Samoa. This building is now home to the Museum of Australian Democracy, and democracy is a subject and a practice on which our guest is a leading authority. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge the, the traditional owners, the land upon which we meet, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. I'd also like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Uh, Michael's already uh, done acknowledgements and I love the Pacific tradition of just saying all protocols observed, um, which I think covers all sins, but I will break that just to acknowledge a few people, if people can indulge me. I'd like to acknowledge Simon Birmingham, the Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs, Michael McCormack, the Shadow Minister for International Development and the Pacific, uh, so Angus Houston, board member, former Chief of the Defence Force, Jan Adams, Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs, and Ewan MacDonald, uh, Head of the Office of the Pacific. I'd also acknowledge all ambassadors and high commissioners here tonight. Uh, as, as well as acknowledging um, uh, the traditional owners, I'd also like to restate my commitment as a member of the Albanese government uh, to implementing the Uluru Statement from the heart in full, voice, treaty and truth. In Australia, we are proud to be home to one of the oldest continuous cultures in the world. We have first connections here. First Nations Connections history with, our, with the Pacific family through shared geography, history and kinship ties that stretch across the Blue Pacific. And they provide a strong foundation to engage on shared interests with partners in our region. They are just one but very important subset of our people-to-people -people links. As Michael alluded to, another of our people-to-people -people links is on the sporting field. And it'd be remiss of me not to congratulate the Prime Minister again on the wonderful performance of the Samoan Rugby League team at the Rugby League World Cup last year. And I'd like to make the point that I've made many times in the Pacific, uh, which is if the Australian kangaroo, the players in the Australian kangaroos of Samoan heritage had actually played for Samoa, you would have thrashed us. So congratulations again. But my job here tonight, and it's a great honour to have this job, is to introduce our speaker, the esteemed and highly respected Prime Minister of Samoa, uh, Fiume Naomi Mata'afa. I'm honoured to welcome her, her to Canberra on her first official visit as Prime Minister. Our Foreign Minister Penny Wong and I have valued her wisdom, her graciousness, her tenacity and her leadership, particularly her passionate, committed advocacy on climate change, her principled, thoughtful approach to Pacific regionalism and her determined, honest commitment to building an economically stable and secure future for the Samoan people. And the Pacific family is part of who we are. From the ocean that we share to the deep people and family links across our islands, we take our responsibility as a member of the Pacific family seriously. As a government, our approach to supporting a stronger Pacific family has been to listen, to show up, and to deliver for the priorities of the Pacific. And of course, the biggest priority, as the Prime Minister has been a champion of, is taking action on climate. Prime Minister, you've worked hard to raise awareness of the existential threat posed by climate change to the nations of the Pacific. Looking for any forum or alliance in which you can sway thinking and garner support for change. I'm glad to have this opportunity during your visit to discuss what more we can do together to drive global action on climate change, to keep 1.5 degrees within reach, and build our region's resilience to this existential threat. And as you know, Australia under this government has already legislated much more ambitious national emissions reduction targets. We've set a minimum floor of 43% reduction in our emissions by 2030, and to moving to 83% or more renewable energy production by the end of the decade. And we've returned to being part of the solution. 
That's why we will join at least 105 countries, including the United Kingdom, Germany, Canada, New Zealand, and all Pacific Island countries who are UN members, the co-sponsor Vanuatu's UN General Assembly resolution requesting an ICJ advisory opinion on climate change. This resolution reflects the views of the Pacific Islands Forum leaders that in this shared endeavour, the obligations of all major emitters, past, present and future, should be examined. In your work on climate, you have been and remain, as I said earlier, a deeply committed regionalist, someone who works hard to generate consensus. You said before the world needs to put as much energy into addressing climate change as we have on addressing COVID, and you are right. You've said that the effort has to be collective, and you've clearly put that spirit into action. Samoa, under your leadership, remains an active player in the Pacific Islands Forum. Your leadership has helped reinforce the centrality of Pacific architecture and the importance of a united Pacific family. We can navigate our shared challenges best when we do it together. You've also committed to hosting the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting next year, the first Pacific Island nation ever to do so. And I saw your advocacy in the Chogham Forum firsthand in Rwanda, where you argued passionately and eloquently and effectively for action on climate change and justice for the Pacific. None of this advocacy and engagement is an accident. It is the determined, continued focus of a nation seeking to deliberately influence the world around it in positive ways. In a sense, we shouldn't be surprised that the leadership Prime Minister FMA has shown, both in Samoa and across the region. When Samoa led the Pacific in achieving independence in 1962, her father was Samoa's first Prime Minister. Her mother, too, was an MP and High Commissioner to New Zealand. Prime Minister FMA first entered Parliament in 1985 and has over time held almost every portfolio. She was Samoa's first female minister, as Education Minister in 1991, first female Deputy Prime Minister and first female Prime Minister. So it is a true honour for our country to host her this week. Prime Minister, I believe you are one of the great statespeople of our time. I'm privileged to work with you and to learn from you. I would like to thank you for your continued leadership and for your ongoing commitment and that of Samoans around the region to building a peaceful and prosperous Pacific. I'm very much looking forward to hearing what you have to say tonight, and I'd be grateful if you could come to the stage. Thank you very much. Mr Conroy, your parliamentary colleagues, uh, the representatives of the Australian government. I'd like to acknowledge the Lowy family members of the board, and of course, Dr. Fulila for uh, the arrangements and inviting me uh, tonight. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Dalo Falava and warm Pacific greetings. I'm honored to be given the opportunity to deliver this specific lecture as has been the tradition for the Lowy Institute to host world leaders in order to foster positive relations between Australia and our respective countries. I have been asked to provide through Samoa-focused lenses, specific perspectives on the region's most pressing challenges and opportunities. And there are a few. The Pacific Islands occupy a vast oceanic region that covers almost 20% of the Earth's surface and is home to the world's largest concentration of microstates. I quote from the renowned Pacific writer, Ebeli Haofa, Oceania is us, we are the sea, we are the ocean. We should not be defined by the smallness of our islands, but the greatness of our oceans. The Pacific's three ethno-geographic subregions of Melanesia, Micronesia, and Polynesia include 10 sovereign states, 
five freely associated states, and eight dependent territories. For the Pacific region and its island countries, the ocean is crucial. Exercising a sense of common identity and purpose linked to the ocean has been critical for protecting and promoting the potential of our shared Pacific Ocean. It is this commonality of the fundamental essence of the region which has the potential to empower the region through collective and combined agendas and actions. The Blue Pacific narrative will strengthen the existing policy frameworks that harness the ocean as a driver of a transformative sociocultural, political, and economic development of the Pacific. And it gives renewed impetus to deepening Pacific regionalism. We know that we can do more together than alone. While Pacific countries vary widely in population, economic circumstances, development, political status, and stability, they face several common challenges, each amplified by the de devastating impact of COVID-19 pandemic and the pervasive impacts of climate change. These challenges include political leadership and regionalism, peace and security, economic development, climate change related impacts, natural disasters, oceans and the environment, technology and connectivity, and the intensification of geostrategic competition exacerbating the region's existing vulnerabilities. At their 2019 meeting in Tuvalu, forum leaders further highlighted these concerns and subsequently endorsed the development of the 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific Continent, a strategy that reinforces commitment and working together as a collective for advancing Pacific regionalism based on the Blue Pacific narrative. Pacific Island leaders have nonetheless recognized the need for a new, inclusive, and game-changing approach to Pacific regionalism. A regionalism that can not only realize the unmet development needs of Pacific Island peoples, but also meet the demands of a new global development paradigm. At the heart of this approach is an emphasis on inclusive policy development and implementation, as well as recognition of the political dimension for ensuring development outcomes for the Pacific. The 2050 strategy encapsulates how we can best work together to achieve our shared vision and aspirations. It is based on the firm recognition of the strategic, cultural, and economic value that our Blue Pacific region holds for us and our shared commitment to protect and leverage this value. Therefore, the newly emerging rave, wave of regionalism maintains a people-centered lens and Pacific control of a regional agenda. It fosters wider political engagement and maneuvers creatively through and around structures with the common goal of improving the lives of our Pacific peoples. It seeks to achieve the key objectives of sustainable development that combines economic, social, and cultural development in ways that improve livelihoods and well being and uses the environment sustainably. 
economic growth that is inclusive and equitable, strengthened governance, legal, financial, and administrative systems, and security that ensures stable and safe human, environmental, and political conditions for all. It expresses the political ambition of our leaders to navigate the Pacific through the global and regional geopolitical forces that impact on our region's ability to achieve development outcomes for our people. In this context, development actors need to work with us, understand the politics of development in our region, and seek to engage with us in a way that supports our agency and leadership on sustainable development. As well, it emphasizes specific leadership and ownership on regional opportunities and challenges. My country, Samoa, has always advocated for a re-energized and robust Pacific Forum process through which all development partners work with at the regional level, even with the preference to deliver bilaterally. For the member countries, this will add value to the efficacy of their respective prioritization processes. This has resulted in creating a platform for the PAM process with Japan, the US Pacific Summit, and the Korea Pacific Summit. It is against this background that we have made all efforts to reconnect our Pacific family, including strengthening our regional institutions, in particular, our premier educational institute the University of the South Pacific. The USB has contributed significantly towards shaping the framework for the Pacific regionalism through intellectual dialogue and to interface with people who are actively engaged in redefining the way the Pacific framework should work. The collaboration between the USP and other institutes in the region can leverage research-based sustainable solutions for issues facing the region. We have learned from the past of examples that are testimony to the strength of our own Pacific diplomacy, which included successful outcomes from the COP21 climate talks in Paris in 2015. The advocacy for the SDG 14 on oceans and the inclusion of loss and damage on the climate change agenda during COP 27. Climate change remains the single greatest threat to the well being, livelihoods, and security of Pacific peoples. Taking into account the insufficient global response to limit temperatures below 1.5 degrees Celsius. As a small island developing state, as well as the chair of the Alliance of Small Island States, AOSIS, we will continue to advocate for ratcheting up ambitious targets and urgent follow through in the implementation of the nationally determined contributions. For Samoa, we are aiming to reach a target of 100% electrification through renewables by 2030 and to promote urgent and inclusive transformation of the land and maritime transport sectors towards decarbonization. The Pacific will remain persistent in urging major emitters to phase out all fossil fuel subsidies and accelerate actions towards 
transitioning to low greenhouse gas emission, climate resilient economies. Climate financing is crucial to ensure transformational investments in order to achieve the net zero by 2050 goal. However, we cannot achieve that if funding for the root causes of climate change is exponentially greater than investment in appropriate response to climate change. We continue to see devastating impacts of climate change on our neighbors like Vanuatu, having recently been hit by cyclones Judy and Freddie within a few days. This is our reality, and that is why we will never stop pushing for all to do their part. Samoa's role as the chair of the Alliance of Small Island States emphasizes AOSIS's advocacy role as a strategic necessity and is the thread that binds its work. It must be said that the active engagement of all members, in particular the Pacific members at the highest political level, is critical to achieving our desired objectives. The Commonwealth has always been a champion for small island developing states and the escalating concerns about the ongoing climate crisis. Samoa will be bringing our Commonwealth family to our Blue Pacific region in 2024, as alluded to by Minister Conroy. There is no better place to discuss solutions and concrete responses to the climate crisis than in the home of those who stand to lose the most. Similarly, the Pacific offers solidarity to support Australia's bid for the COP in 2026. Our Blue Pacific continent is fast becoming an increasingly contested strategic space. The question for us is how prepared are we to tackle the, em the emerging associated challenges. Regional and national stability has never been more critical in order to maintain peace and security, prosperity and well-being of all our Pacific peoples. We are faced with the perplexities of varying versions of the Indo-Pacific strategies. The resultant partnerships that have emerged from the diversity of networks and alliances, as well as the underlying lack of understanding of the Pacific countries of how and when the two large ocean spaces morphed into the Indo-Pacific and, and the rationale behind the concept. Why? because this is the basis of the geostrategic approaches of the development partners working in the region. I have to, I feel I need to be very frank and to say to this gathering tonight that in the Pacific, we feel our partners have fallen short of acknowledging the integrity of Pacific leadership and the responsibility they carry for every decision made as a collective and individually in order to garner support for the sustainable development of our nations. Such acknowledgements can simply be in the form of information sharing and open consultation if we consider ourselves as a Pacific family and looking to find solutions in the Pacific way. The shifting global and regional geopolitics is creating an increasingly complex and crowded region that places the Pacific at the center of contemporary global geopolitics. 
This trend, coupled with broader challenges, such as climate change and disaster risk, rising inequalities, resource depletion, maritime boundary disputes, and advances in technology, will continue to shape the Pacific regional security environment. Pacific Island Forum members have a proud history of working collectively in response to events and issues that have challenged regional security, peace and stability in the past. The Pacific region's current geopolitical and geostrategic context underlines the need for an integrated and comprehensive security architecture incorporating an expanded concept of security. A stable and resilient security environment provides the platform for achieving the region's sustainable development aspirations. We welcome the efforts by some of our development actors to keep the Pacific countries consistently informed of security developments specific to their countries, but which can have potential impact on the Pacific region. On that note, I was very fortunate to have a security briefing earlier this afternoon by your security teams. And I'm very thankful for the sharing of that information. While we, may, while we become, we may become, an unwilling actor in the current tensions around the Pacific Rim by virtue of our geography, it may be pertinent to ask how our region can assert our geography as the basis for promoting regional and global peace, as was done with the work of the Rarotonga Treaty. In terms of economic growth, I wish to acknowledge Australia and New Zealand's support towards the post-COVID recovery through the important contribution, contribution of labor mobility and what it makes to the economy of all participating countries. While considering the nuances of expanding labor mobility, we must ensure that we maximize the benefits and minimize any negative impacts on the livelihoods and business domestically in labor sending countries. It is important that regular consultations take place and that there is the opportunity to review from time to time the efficacy of the schemes to ensure unfair disadvantage of either side. Pacific countries with limited human resource capacities cannot sustain development efforts with regular brain drain. Of great importance to Pacific sending countries is the commitment to ensure that workers' rights and welfare conditions are socialized, safeguarded, and implemented in a timely manner. It is also important to note that in terms of development cooperation, Australia recognizes the importance of long-term commitments and predictability to effective planning and sustainable change for partner countries and have instituted agreed to arrangements to facilitate policy policy shifts, as well as accepting the integrity of the use of partner country systems. It is also important to maintain close communication and cooperation in order to shape policies and institutions to drive inclusive and sustainable economic growth, including working closely with all willing development partners through processes such as the Joint Policy Action Matrix Dialogue. 
such a process encapsulates the advancing of economic reforms to achieve sustainable growth and prudent debt management. All PESA plus signatory countries are committed to closer regional economic integration through working together and with the PESA plus implementation unit based in Apia to drive the implementation of PESA plus and facilitating the flow of goods, services, capital, and people across signatory countries. We will also collaborate on biosecurity and market access to enhance trade flows. We very much look forward to stronger partnerships for economic growth, for security and stronger relationships between our people. There is a clear need to reinforce and support existing and promising approaches, particularly those that are non-partisan and non-interventionist. In closing, let me again express my appreciation for the invitation to deliver some specific perspectives of the region we share. I would also like to acknowledge the assistance which has been provided by the Australian educational and research institutions to the Pacific countries and to Samoa, in particular since the end of the Second World War. At a time when the Pacific is in need of research on so many issues of vital importance to the Pacific, it is the Lowy Institute that has filled in some of the very important research gaps by placing significant focus on the Pacific region. But I do have to say, Michael, mostly in Melanesia. <laughs> I wish again to thank the Lowy Institute. All the best for your very important work as we move into the future. And I want to acknowledge all of you and thank you as colleagues for your interest in the Blue Pacific and its future development. Thank you. Well, thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you very much for those thoughtful and wide-ranging remarks which deserve to be read widely around the region. And thank you also for the Prime Ministerial feedback, um, which is noted. And a lot of my brilliant uh, colleagues from our Pacific team are here today. So we'll, we'll have a talk about that feedback. So thank you. Um, thank you also, PM, for agreeing to take some questions from me for, for 10 minutes or so. And then the PM has agreed to take questions from the audience. So if you, if you get your questions ready, if you catch my eye, um, the PM may be, may be willing to take some questions from you. PM, you talked about so many different issues, but let me start with climate change because you identified it as the number one security threat in the Pacific and you mentioned the effects that Vanuatu and other countries have felt. Uh, I know you're just back from, from London, so you've got a bit of a global view that you can share with us. How optimistic are you that the world will reach agreements that limit dangerous warming? And how comfortable are you with the efforts that Australia has committed to in the last year? Well, it's always best to start closer to home. And... Uh, the latter part of your question had to do with um, advancements in Australia's um, stance on climate change. So I think I need to take the opportunity here at the Lowy Institute um, to say how much the Pacific family uh, has appreciated the newer commitments that have been made by the Australian government um, on climate change, your own uh, nationally determined contributions, the targets to which you have set, which are very significant. Um, and I would like to congratulate you all 
Um, and I think I need to uh, acknowledge, you know, Samoa's, uh, Samoa and other Pacific countries are, are so small. You know, it doesn't take uh, a lot of data collection or, you know, huge surveys to determine what people are thinking. You know, you can, you can gauge that very quickly. Uh, but what I did note um, with the developments um, in Australia's um, advancing uh, positions on climate change is that a lot of that had to do with your public and the stance that your constituents uh, were presenting to. So, you know, as a politician, you know, I, I sort of see things in those lenses. Um, and I think, you know, I do have to credit the Australian uh, public. I mean, of course, there are varying views, um, but I think it is to such a degree where the government has uh, made those commitments. Now, the last COP in Shamal Sheikh um, was a bit um, underwhelming, I think was the word, um, the, polit uh, the polite word. Uh, and we were <laughs> concerned uh, from the Pacific that there seemed to be some backsliding in terms of what we had understood to be global agreements on the 1.5. Um, the AOSIS uh, group very quickly uh, made presentations to um, the uh, uh, to the convention, to, to the conference. Um, presenting this concern that uh, we were seeing. Uh, we do understand, of course, that that particular region, you know, with, with its uh, uh, fuels and so forth, they, you know, they have a particular view. Um, the next um, COP is also going to be in the same region. Um, so, you know, we in the Pacific and those of us who are all advocating for um, <coughs> timely interventions to the climate crisis. Uh, I hope that we will keep up the pressure to ensure that you know, the commitments that have been agreed to in uh, past conferences can be upheld um, and that the work is carried forward. Um, the loss and damage uh, issue um, I think it was quite significant at the last COP, a bit of good news. Uh, it's formally uh, on the books, so to speak, uh, with proposals to develop uh, funding um, models of how that work can be carried out. And it is a demonstration of progress. So although it, seem, it would seem... Uh, at times, perhaps, uh, we're not moving towards our goals as fast as we should be. I think we still need to acknowledge uh, some of the wins that we are achieving and to just pursue those and advocate strongly. And for those who are able to make, you know, the significant contributions, especially to funding, um, research, um, it's very important that that keeps going. So right. I'm optimistic. All right. Let me ask <clears throat> you about some other security issues. You alluded um, to the increasing competition that the region sees between the United States and its allies on the one hand and China on the other. Um, let me ask... Um, let me invite you to speak a little bit more about that if, if, if you're open to it. And in particular, let me ask you about the issue that's in the headlines this week, and that is AUKUS. A couple of times you mentioned the importance of consultation and you thanked the Australian government for some security briefings, which I presume was on AUKUS. But can I ask you about the substance of those briefings? Um, do you think that, do you feel comfortable with the AUKUS arrangements as they've been announced? Um, well, I think um, I said in my comments that, um, and I think this is framed around the new narrative of the Indo-Pacific, and that has become the founding narrative, you know, for 
uh, development partners, you know, especially the morphing together of these two big oceans. Now, the Pacific Islands were never consulted about that new narrative or had a discussion around it. I think, you know, perhaps Fiji might have been invited to one or two uh, meetings. Um, but then it's quite interesting, you know, we had the summit last year in September with the Americans. Uh, they talk about Indo-Pacific, Australia and New Zealand talk about Indo-Pacific, Japan talks to us about Indo-Pacific, everyone talks to us about Indo-Pacific. And I think there's an assumption there that we know what they're talking about, and actually we don't. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we're having to inform ourselves as best we can. But, you know, if given that we occupy, you know, a very large space of one of those oceans, one might have thought that having some input uh, from the Pacific Islands might have been a good idea mm. uh, as we moved in that, into that new narrative. But, you know, I think we were quite used to it. Uh, we don't really want to throw any tantrums or anything like that. Um, we'd like to be um, helpful. Um, I think given, you know, when the opportunities arise that we can make uh, comments, but I think um, I was sharing with colleagues who were giving me the security briefing this afternoon. Uh, this whole thing about foreign policy, right? Which a large part of this ha has now got to do with security. And I'm reminded of um, the former King of Tonga, Tupo V, when he was uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs. He was asked by a reporter, what was Tonga's foreign policy? And he said, foreign policy? We don't have foreign policy. And this poor reporter was quite stumped because, of course, he's talking to the foreign minister and does expect a very comprehensive reply, you know, and not that kind of answer. And so he said, oh, could you explain yourself further? And um, the minister then said, well, it is our lot in the Pacific that other people have foreign policies. We just navigate our way around them. So I think, you know, there's a lot of truth in that. Um, and I think it's also why we from Samoa advocate so strongly for regionalism. Mm -hmm. um, because as a block, you get a bit more attention. As tiny little islands, no one really sort of pays too much attention to you. So um, I think the experience of, you know, the advocacy, especially around climate change, uh, the advocacy that we did as a region around the Rarotonga Treaty on nuclear issues, um, this, you know, it, it has built up, um, you know, the credibility of, um, the Pacific's participation in, in foreign policy and, and foreign affairs. Am I answering your question? You, you, you provided a, a wonderful answer, um, PM. I don't think you, you quite came at the question of the, the nuclear-powered submarines. And all oh, those. right. <laughs> That's very easy, Michael. That's none of my business. Okay. <laughs> I mean... We understand it, and I think uh, Minister Conroy, who unfortunately had to leave us, um, and I think yourself in your introductory comments, you know, this is how Australia sees, you know, its role um, in, in the security aspects of, of the region, and we understand that. Um, and I think with the further integration of New Zealand and Australia into the Pacific family. Um, Australia is now part of Melanesia. New Zealand is part of Polynesia. You know, I think we're deepening, you know, um, opportunities to be talking to each other a lot more about those sorts of things. 
And I can't tell you what your security people told me this afternoon. <laughs> There's lots of redefinitions of regions happening. Um, let, me, let me ask you, I want to come to the audience and give them an opportunity um, to ask a question, but I, I, I do want to ask um, PM as the first female Prime Minister of your country, um, named recently by the BBC as among the 100 most influential women around the world. Can you reflect? It's not bad. It's not bad. Can, can you reflect a little bit about the role of women in the Pacific? Um, and can you tell us, is there a particular female leader that you've admired over the course of your career from whom you've taken inspiration? Mm. Well, it, it's no secret. Um, that the Pacific still uh, has the lowest representation uh, of women in our respective uh, parliaments. And there are still some of us who don't have any women. I think in the early days of the gender issue, uh, some of us around this room might recall the, you know, the first uh, decade uh, for women. Uh, one of the the indicators uh, of, you know, su successful uh, women's participation in public life um, was linked to the general economic um, status of a country. So I still would tend to think that that indicator and the cause, perhaps, of, um, you know, this low representation amongst many other gender disparities, is that you know, our respective economies has, has not uh, reached that level where the basic services uh, for women, especially around their responsibilities uh, to their families, um, you know, the burden is still upon the women to carry out. You know, so our economies, you know, we're not able to give them the, the benefits. We're not able to give them the services that may free them up uh, to perhaps participate more uh, rigorously in political life. So, I mean, Australia has been a, a leading donor in the Pacific um, on, on gender e equality. Uh, the Rarotonga Declaration when was it again? 2012? Somewhere around there. Anyway, that was the first time uh, that the leaders, the Pacific leaders, made a gender uh, declaration. And um, I think there is discussion. It needs to be revisited. Um, and there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. I mean, the questions are a lot of resourcing has gone into this, um, both fiscal and human resourcing technological resourcing. Um, so the question being posed is, why is there not enough change? And was there one female lady that you've looked up to? Well, funnily enough, um, it's not necessarily national leaders. The, the women leaders have had, a, had an impact on me, of course, are my family and the communities. And um, I'm, I've always been active in uh, young women's and women's uh, organizations. So there's so many leaders there. And it's quite interesting, you know, for me as a politician, you know, since 1985, I still find uh, that when I go, you know, back to those organizations that I belong to or I'm at a conference where it brings together uh, women, um, I draw such a lot of um, energy uh, from them, you know. So it's still a, a, a basis of uh, a source of energy uh, for me. All right, thank you, PM. Let's take a few questions, two or three questions I'd like to. So please, if you'd like to pose a question to the PM, please put your hand up. 
Yes, I see Meg Keane and Simon Birmingham. So we, we might start with those two and then I'll take one more if we can fit it in. So first of all, no, no, let me let me call on you first, Meg, head of the Pacific Islands Program at the Lowy Institute. Thank you very much for that fantastic presentation. I think we're all going to be pouring over it for some time to come uh, and, and thinking about all the points you've made. But one really stood out for me when you were talking about Pacific leadership and the need for a game-changing approach, particularly regionally. And you did mention the game-changing approach with the Rarotonga uh, Treaty. But I'm wondering what in contemporary times a game-changing approach looks like from a Pacific lens. Thank you. Well, I've been reflecting on, on that a lot. And one of the lessons that I've more recently learned is when I went to the Chogham uh, Leaders Meeting in Rwanda last year and the journey that that country has taken uh, to where it finds itself now since the genocide of the early to mid-90s. Now, when we're talking early mid-90s, you know, it's just a matter of 30, 40 years. It's one generation. Um, I, I regret that I didn't do a lot more reading about Rwanda before I went. Um, but when I arrived at that country, it looked like a developed country. I saw people walking around freely, especially women. And we all know the statistic, you know, that Rwanda is famous for, that they have more than 50% uh, women in their parliament, and also more than 50% women in their cabinet, and young. So if we're talking about game changing, you know, the Pacific is small, its populations are small. It really needs to use a lot more of its human resource. And I don't think we've done that enough and paid attention to that. We can have the aid dollar and, of course, the opportunities that are available for education and training is very significant when we're talking about buildings capacities, especially of our youth. Um, but I don't think we utilize it in a way that I've seen how they've done it in Rwanda. And I think that's... And engaging a lot more people in the process of economic growth. You know, governments are so much bigger in small countries. And everyone thinks... You know, the government is the answer to everything. That mindset needs to change as well. We need to be able to ensure that there's a much wider participation than just merely the government in the development and growth of our economies. Thank you. Senator Birmingham? <laughs> Probably don't need it, please. Prime Minister, thank you very much for your, your wide-ranging and thoughtful address tonight and for spending this week in Australia and travelling through a number of Australian states as well. It is, uh, it is very grateful. Can I ask perhaps two questions? I'll be cheeky there. One, building a little upon the message for the Pacific voice to be heard more powerfully and how you think Australia can help to empower that Pacific voice, that regional architecture to be heard in other capitals around the world and what support can we provide through our foreign service, by other means to, to empower that Pacific voice to be as strongly as possible. And then perhaps to come back to the bilateral relationship you spoke about, labour mobility, PESA plus, what would be the priorities that Australia could lend to help with the economic empowerment and achieving those aspirations that you have in leading Samoa? to achieve stronger economic outcomes in the future? Mm. Uh, the first part of your question about how Australia helps with the Pacific voice, uh, I mean, the best example of that is creating opportunities for the Pacific and ensuring Pacific participation 
either by sponsorship or using your aeroplanes just to get us around <laughs> to places. Um, and also helping um, us refine uh, the message, um, taking the message to other fora uh, that the Pacific doesn't necessarily have a, a voice in. And where I made mention of the further integration of New Zealand and Australia into the Pacific architecture, now Australia is a member of the Melanesian subregion. Um, you know, I think that's a, an, another way where if Australia speaks, it can speak, I think, uh, a lot more, well, a lot stronger in, in terms of this new format that we've moved into uh, Pacific um, architecture and the organization around uh, regionalism. Uh, with respect to the labor mobility, um, that seems to have been a bit contentious lately. Um, but that's mostly because you move a lot faster than we do. So, you know, your policy shifts uh, are faster. We're having to catch up. Uh, but I think, um, as I said in my comments, is that we need to have, you know, regular review of these agreements that we come to. Um, the labor mobility scheme um, has assisted uh, Pacific countries greatly uh, over the COVID uh, and how our, our respective economies have been impacted, uh, you know, especially around um, tourism, uh, the retailing and services uh, industries and so forth. Um, so it, the, the, the scheme has really, you know, um, brought support uh, to families, and of course, you know, the, it carries through then uh, to the whole monetary system and uh, assists with our balance of payments and uh, so forth. Um, but then, equally, we are now experiencing the impact, essentially, of brain drain, because initially the schemes that started off in the agricultural and horticultural so from the sending countries, it was mostly the unemployed. But because uh, the scheme has now expanded to other sectors, uh, we are now moving into the more uh, skilled uh, labor force. So we are feeling the impact um, of that now. Now, we had the leaders uh, special retreat uh, earlier this month in Fiji. And we took the issue um, to the leaders' meeting. And there was some thinking, you know, perhaps uh, as sending countries, we need to sort of get together and talk before we talk to, you know, New Zealand and Australia. And we said, no, that's not what Samoa is saying. What we are saying is that we sat down together and we talked through this. If there are issues, it's important that we sit down and continue to to have that uh, dialogue. Now, I'm going to be very contentious and say uh, that, you know, labor mobility is one thing. We're talking about uh, PESA Plus, you know, and how, you know, uh, the, that can accommodate not only labor mobility, but services and goods and, and, and people. So on the people side, I've just come from the UK who uh, exited Europe, <laughs> um, you know, and that whole concept there of um, the European common market. So we've been talking about that in the Pacific for a long time. And part of that common market is free access of people around the region. I think we need to explore that in the Pacific. Now, when we were talking about that, uh, in Fiji, uh, Penny Wong came from here, and the Deputy Prime Minister of New Zealand uh, attended uh, on behalf of their leader. And it was quite interesting. P 
Penny Wong didn't say anything when I sort of uh, suggested, you know, we might look at sort of common market type arrangement. But the Deputy Prime Minister of New Zealand, who's part Samoan and part Tongan, said, oh, but all, all the people in the islands will want to come and live in New Zealand and Australia. I said, well, I think that's what you might think. But, what, but you might think also that if we have easy access, you know, people can just come, do their business, visit their relatives, go on holiday in New Zealand and Australia, but go back home and not have a, you know, such a difficult time coming into Australia or New Zealand. So it's just a thought. <laughs> I'm going to take one more question. We have a lot of friends from the Pacific uh, in the room. I'd love to take a question from someone in the Pacific if they would like to ask one. Um, please. But if not, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take one more question. Yes, ma'am. The final question of the evening. Thank you for your address, Prime Minister. You mentioned leveraging uh, strategic geography to promote peace. Can you talk about that a bit more? Mm. So, how can I explain this? By example, okay. Um, the United States, as a development partner, hasn't really uh, been that <coughs> visible in our part of the world. In fact, they left probably 15, 20 years ago, left it to Australia. And, um, but more recently, uh, we were asked to have a summit of the leaders uh, with the President of the United States. So, they're recognizing our geographical space. Um, for all the reasons they have, and we think we understand. But nevertheless, the attention is there. Now, it might be a good thing, and it might not be such a good thing. Sometimes it's just good to go under the radar. Um, but that's the situation of the geopolitics. There's now an interest in the Pacific, and we're geographically placed. So the people are beginning to talk to us, um, and uh, and we have to take up that opportunity uh, because there are very many uh, issues, challenges, and opportunities for us as well. Um, you know, and we look to our neighbours and family here in the Pacific to help us navigate that. Um, but it's, first of all, um, understanding that before, people just used to see the Pacific as a big ocean with um, a few dots in it. Uh, but now, because the situation has changed, they actually see us, or they see the Pacific in a different way. And it's not an opportunity to be missed. PM, thank you for taking our questions with great dignity and humour and intelligence and wisdom and for being a little contentious, as you put it. We, <laughs> we love that at the Lowy Institute. Um, let me call upon, before we finish, let me call upon Anne-Marie O'Keefe to deliver the vote of thanks. Anne-Marie is Chair of the Foundation for Development Cooperation She's a long-time non-resident fellow of the Lowy Institute and a colleague of mine and a very senior former Australian diplomat and aid official. So, Anne-Marie, perhaps you would move a vote of thanks to the PM. Prime Minister, it's my great honour to have been asked to thank you for your inspirational speech and the observations at this, uh, the Foundation for Development Cooperation's inaugural Pacific Lecture hosted by the Lowy Institute. You may or may not remember, but we first met in the late 1990s when you were Samoa's Minister of Education and I was an Australian aid official 
visiting your country for aid talks. As Samoa's first female cabinet minister, you already had a region-wide reputation as a visionary Pacific leader with a deep understanding of the development challenges facing Samoa and the broader Pacific. My then boss, who went on to become the head of AusAid, gave me really strict instructions to listen to you and to take on board what you were saying. And of course, nobody would ever not do that when it was Bruce Davis telling me to listen. But I'll be frank, I, I was very nervous about meeting you because of that reputation. What did I have to offer to our conversation about development in the Pacific? Now, more than two decades later, you're Samoa's first female Prime Minister, and we collectively have had the privilege this evening of hearing your frank analysis of the challenges that confront the Pacific and the way forward. It is clearly a difficult pathway for the blue Pacific continent. You and other Pacific leaders must manage a region-wide, potentially destabilising geopolitical competition for influence. At the same time, you must respond domestically and internationally to climate change, which is, as you've described it, the single greatest threat to the Blue Pacific. You also have to respond to the enduring and emerging obstacles to improved social and economic prosperity across the region and within your individual countries, while at the same time acting on opportunities to promote that prosperity. You have also reminded us this evening of the frustrations you suffer when partners fall short of listening to the Pacific leadership. Tonight, you have given us a fulsome insight into what it means to be a Pacific leader. And this is why the Foundation for Development Cooperation is supporting this lecture series and why we at the Foundation were so keen that it was you who was the inaugural speaker. We were going to hound your office till you said yes. <laughs> Inspired by the Lowy Institute's outstanding work on the Pacific, the Foundation believes it has found the right partner in the Institute to further its own ambition of harnessing and leveraging the Blue Pacific's collective skills, knowledge and organisational resources. Prime Minister, your words this evening underscore the critical need for the Pacific voice to be heard and to be listened to. And so, distinguished guests, I would ask you to join me in a round of applause to thank the Prime Minister for her guiding and visionary words tonight to the Samoan Prime Minister. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne-Marie. PM, let me add my thanks um, to Anne-Marie's. Um, you spoke about, you were asked about what could be the game changer, but I think tonight you've been a game changer for all of us. So thank you very much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us here at the Institute. The Lowy Institute is headquartered in Sydney, but we're a national institution. It's important to us that uh, we're represented here in Canberra. So thank you for coming along to an occasion on which I, I think you'll agree was a special one at which all of us got to learn um, at the feet of a great uh, Pacific statesperson. The PM quoted a memorable line at the beginning of her speech. Uh, she said, the Pacific should be defined by the greatness of the oceans, not the smallness of the islands. And I take that as an injunction to all of us to think big. And the PM has, has tonight been thinking big and I think all of us will, will do that in response. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here. As you leave, you'll see 
as Minister Conroy mentioned, the, the, the facade of Old Parliament House illuminated in the colours of the Samoan flag. Thank you very much for being here. I'm going to try my best here, PM. Manuia Masoifua. Thank you very much. Okay. Very good. <laughs>